Chokma, Aslaka Chokma, Sahuchi Fort, Shannon Speed, Chikasha, Mr. Chakta Saya, UCLA American Indian Studies Center Director Saya, Gabrielino Tongva, Obla Kod, Iagi Mako, Apisahanji, B. Kanatoka, Hachimanoli. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to today's, today's special event. I'm Shannon Speed, and I am Chickasaw Choctaw by descent, and I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. I'm the director of the UCLA American Indian Studies Center. In my Chickasaw greeting, I recognize the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers, Tovanga, the unceded land that encompasses much of what is currently called Los Angeles, as well as the South Channel Islands, and upon which the American Indian Studies Center and UCLA reside. <clears throat> as a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the Honuk Nitam ancestors, Ahihiram elders, and Eohingem our relatives, relations, past, present, and emerging. The AISC couldn't be more thrilled to partner with Repair, and I want to acknowledge uh, the wonderful Beth Rebe as the principal organizer of this event, and co-sponsors Innovations Human Trafficking Collaborative and the UCLA Center for the Study of Women. Again, Hashlaka Chukma, welcome. And Chukmashki, thank you for joining us for today's important conversation. I want to note that Amber and David are with us as our ASL interpretation team, and people can pin their video if they need ASL access. I'll put, um, we'll, we'll be throwing some more instructions into the chat to make things easier for you to follow. So I'm going to introduce, uh, I should say that our uh, esteemed moderator, Chris Stark, um, could not be with us today due to illness, so I'm filling in for her. And I'll start by introducing our panelists, and then we'll open it up for them to give a few moments or minutes of comments um, before we go to some questions and back and forth. We'll end um, with time uh, to open the chat for Q&A for questions from the audience as well. Uh, so our first panelist is Sarah Deer. She's a citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma and a university distinguished professor at the University of Kansas. Ending Violence Against Women is her life's goal. Her 2015 book, The Beginning and End of Rape, Confronting Sexual Violence in Native America, is the culmination of over 25 years of working with survivors and has received several awards, including the first Best First Book Award from the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association. Professor Deer was named a MacArthur Foundation Fellow in 2014 and a Carnegie Fellow in 2020. In 2019, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. She currently teaches at the University of Kansas, her alma mater, where she holds a joint appointment in Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and the School of Public Affairs and Administration. Professor Deer is also the Chief Justice for the Prairie Island Indian Community Court of Appeals. Sarah Deer was born in Silver Spring, Maryland, but was raised in Wichita, Kansas, where she spent her high school years participating in History Day, debate, forensics, theater, and volleyball. She currently lives in Lawrence, Kansas, with her husband, Neil, and their two dogs, Noah and Doc. Her interests include Muscogee language revitalization, snarky cross stitch, and watching silly shows on Netflix. Her second participant is Stephanie Lumsden. She's an enrolled member of the Hoopa Valley Tribe in Northern California. She received her bachelor's degree in women's studies from Portland State University in 2011 and her master's degree in Native American studies from the University of California Davis, my alma mater, in 2014. She earned her second master's degree in gender studies in 2018. She is currently a PhD student in the Gender Studies Department at UCLA, and she's also a lecturer in Native American Studies at Humboldt State University and a recipient of the 2020-2021 Ford Doctoral Dissertation Fellowship. Our <clears throat> third speaker is Diane Millian. She is um, Tanana at the Baskin and an associate professor and chair of the Department of American Indian Studies and affiliate faculty in Canadian Studies and the Comparative History of Ideas program at the University of Washington in Seattle. She is an, the author of Therapeutic Nations, Healing in an Age of Indigenous Human Rights from uh, University of Arizona Press 2013, as well as numerous articles, chapters, and poems. Dr. Millian centers her work on questions arising from the effect affect of capitalism slash settler colonialism on indigenous family and community health in North America. Informed by two generations of indigenous feminist scholarship, Millian seeks to illuminate the ways in which indigenous life recognizes, re I'm sorry, reorganizes in the face of colonial violence and settler social welfare narratives of trauma, 
to embrace lives that are integral to peoples, their histories, and their places. Um, and our final participant is Dr. Sandy Pierce. Uh, she's an applied sociologist of, the Seneca, of Seneca and European descent, holding master's and doctoral degrees in sociology from the University of Minnesota. In 2009, she authored Shattered Hearts, the first research ever published in the United States on commercial sexual exploitation of American Indian girls and women. A survivor herself, Sandy has 30 years experience in, in research and program evaluation focused on native women's experiences with sexual violence and trafficking. She currently serves as a research affiliate for Innovations Human Trafficking Collaborative and sits on advisory councils for Shared Hope and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Please join me, everyone, in welcoming our guests. So for each, if may, perhaps in the, in the order I've just introduced you, if you all could just um, take a few minutes to say anything um, that you'd like to start out by saying about Indigenous perspectives on policing. And, and then we'll, we'll move into the questions. So we'll start with you, Sarah, please. Thank you very much. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, yeah. okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you to everyone who's put this together. There's a lot of work go that goes into preparing for a, a webinar such as this or a conversation such as this. It's not just turning on Zoom, there's planning, there's creating space for everyone who wants to participate. So thank you to all of the folks that put work into this event. And I'm really, really honored to be here. Um, I'm just going to be sharing um, some data, which troubles me a little bit because data is inherently dehumanizing. And I think this dialogue is going to be anything but dehumanizing, but just in terms of understanding the scope and the magnitude of the problems that we're going to be addressing, I, I offer just a few slides of basic background information in terms of policing um, and the carceral state in, in, in uh, intersecting with the lives of Native people. So I'm gonna be sharing um, a little bit about victimization data, policing data, and then incarceration data. So to make it short, Native people have the highest rate of victimization in the nation when it comes to violent crime. And Native people are also significantly overrepresented in the carceral state in the criminal justice system. So these slides come from the most recent Department of Justice uh, victimization survey. It's actually based on data from uh, the year 2010, but it was released as a, as a formal report in 2016. And so these are the lifetime victimization rates for Native women and Native men. So you can see the lifetime violence in um, the lives of Native women is over 84% and for men over 81%. So the vast majority of Native people have and will experience violence in their lifetimes. And when you look at the sexual violence rate, again, extremely elevated rates, 56% for sexual violence for women and 27% for men. So one of the things that will be important, I think in part, part of our conversation today is who commits these crimes. One of the challenges with any data around native people is that when you create national numbers, they often will miss important nuances and differences between tri different tribal communities. And so this data is national data. It may not reflect the individual experiences of a particular community. But along with this data, we know that the majority of offenders um, of these crimes are non-native. And that's particularly unusual in America most of the time, uh, violent crime, interpersonal crime is considered to be intra-racial. So um, the, the violence is committed by someone of the same race, but the large exception to that general rule is for native people who report that they've had at least one non-native perpetrator. So now I wanna just say a little bit about deadly police encounters. Um, and we know that per capita, Native people are at a very high risk of being killed by police. I'll show you a slide um, in just a second here, but uh, Native Americans are th over three times more likely to be killed by police than white Americans. 
Now, this slide may look familiar to some of you. It's used quite a bit. This comes from, um, the, again, the federal government. This is their own data um, showing the rates um, or the groups most likely to be killed um, by law enforcement. Um, so the, the top bar here, I think, is probably no surprise to most of us who follow these issues and are engaged with these issues, but not as many people are aware of the very high rates um, of police killings against Native people as well. So I just wanted to mark that for discussion. There are um, also um, some localized studies about other over uh, policing in, that doesn't involve killing or brutality, but just the invasiveness of stops and searches. There's not really much national data on this question, but some states and some municipalities have looked at this issue. So for example, in Washington state, when um, the, the state patrol officers pull over a car, um, native drivers or native occupants are more than five times a higher um, likelihood of being searched in addition to the stop. And then we also have um, over stops of native women in particular in Minneapolis. So it's hard to find much national data on this. And I, to, to my estimation, I think national or, lo or local or state or tribal level data is probably more useful when crafting sort of responses and solutions. And then finally, I'll just say a little bit about over incarceration. Um, again, for those of you who work in this issue with um, prison abolition and other efforts to address over incarceration, Native people are incarcerated at double the rates of white Americans. And in some states that have very large populations of Native people, incarcer incarceration rates can be up to seven times higher. Um, the Prison Policy Initiative has some great graphics and visuals that folks can use to describe and talk about these problems. So here on the left is uh, data showing incarceration rates by race and ethnicity. And then they also have specific state slides. Um, and this is the one I pulled, it's from Kansas because that's where I am right now. So you can see that native people in Kansas make up about 1% of the population but 2% of the prison population in the state. Um, prison Policy Initiative also has helpful data on youth in um, in incarcerated youth in America. And you can see here, they've concluded that black and American Indian youth are confined at rates over three times the rate of white youth. So we can't forget that part of the discussion with our young people. And the last thing I'll talk about is just the fact that tribal nations themselves operate jails and oper operate carceral systems. Currently there are over 80 facilities operating on tribal lands with over 2,500 inmates on any given day. That number has slowly been increasing just one to 2% per year. Um, and I did note that almost 20% of folks being held in tribal jails are there for public intoxication, not a violent crime, in other words. And I know that we'll come back to this issue, but one of the things I just want to uh, mark for, for discussion is the question of tribal criminal authority. Um, tribes, by and large, um, especially larger tribes, operate a carceral type criminal justice system with police um, and incarceration. And that, that at the, um, the extent to which tribes can uh, do those things is limited by federal law. So for example, um, tribal courts cannot sentence an offender to more than three years per offense. And we also lack jurisdiction over most non-Indian crime. Um, the only exception is domestic violence. So what the challenge that I see is as somebody who works with victims is because these, these restrictions are imposed by a foreign government, the United States, um, sometimes in fighting for sovereignty, fighting for authority, we're asking for more carceral power, right? We're asking, for example, we ask Congress to lift the restriction on our sentencing authority. And so sometimes when we're talking about criminal justice reform at the tribal level, we have to be really thoughtful about what we're asking for and what we hope to do, because tribes have certainly been encouraged to adopt a Western law and order criminal justice system. 
it's been clearly laid out from the moment that the United States recognized our authority. Um, so I hope we'll have a chance to talk about that a little bit today, and I hope this information um, set the groundwork for a very rich discussion. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Sarah. I think that really did set the groundwork for a rich discussion. So much appreciated. Um, let's turn to you, Stephanie. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Sorry, I'm just thinking now. <laughs> That's the mm -hmm. problem with one after the other is that we'll be thinking um, alongside each other as we go forward. Um, so first, good afternoon to all who are able to uh, join us today. I know there's many of you, uh, many of whom are my friends, colleagues, and comrades, so I'm happy to see all of you. Um, and hello to all those who will view this recording at a later date. I know we're all webinared max now. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much to Repair, and especially to Beth for doing so much of the legwork that these events require. Uh, thank you to Shannon for being willing to offer introductions and, and moderate our discussion. And to all those at the UCLA American Indian Studies Center for all their support um, and help promoting this event. And of course, to my fellow panelists, Sandy, Sarah, and Diane, it's an honor to share space with you all. I've been thinking through your work for, for years, and um, I'm thrilled to be with you all. Um, I'm speaking to you all from unceded Weyot territory in Northwestern California, uh, near my home, my reservation in the Hoopa Valley. Uh, one day, I know I'll get to say that I'm speaking to you from the reclaimed territory of the Weyot, and I look forward to that day. So I'm just speaking it. Um, my friend Katja says that we're supposed to speak a thing we want to see happen. Um, as I sat down to think through what I wanted to be sure to say in the few minutes we each agreed to for our opening comments, a few things occurred to me. So bear with me, please. It's, it's a list. <laughs> Number one, police as an institution are the violent and repressive arm of a white supremacist settler state. They consume the lives of Black and Native people, the lives of other people of color, trans and queer folks and disabled folks, those made most marginal, most marginalized and made vulnerable to violence and abandonment. This is not new information, but that makes it no less ceaseless and horrifying. Every day, the list of those we must mourn because of police violence grows longer. The most recent to public knowledge being um, poor Walter Wallace Jr., who was killed by Philadelphia police just yesterday. I'm um, thinking very much about the people in Philadelphia and, and wishing for their safety and for justice. Two, as many others have pointed out, the murder of George Floyd months ago was responded to with a popular uprising and the movement for black lives showed us how to organize outrage and heartache into a vehement demand for an entirely different world. Black Lives Matter invited all of us to show up and has consistently provided leadership on where we go from here. We're all indebted to their work. Three, Native peoples have our own history with state violence, a long and painful one. Uh, we have our own history with police and policing and surveillance and containment. Um, we have our own history with children being taken and funneled into a pipeline of another kind. Um, and this history must be reckoned with seriously as we make our decisions for our future. For as an, a result of invasion, conquest, and ongoing dispossession, Native peoples are in a state of precarity where we are exposed to violence, trauma, and death. Not one of us has been spared from these terrible circumstances. The desperate need that colonial violence creates for care, community, and justice must not be co-opted by calls for more police. We have to resist that urge. Um, uh, five, police, even tribal police, are not meant to safeguard our health and wellness. Police are a failure, a failure of imagination, a failure to honor who we have always been, a failure to reach 
for the decolonial future we want to live in. Sixth, and finally, yesterday, uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore posed a question in another webinar that kind of stuck with me. Uh, she said that abolition needs decolonization, but she wasn't sure if decolonization needs abolition. Of course, I suspect she knew the answer to this question all along, but let me be clear. There is no decolonial future without abolition. Police do not exist where we are going. I'll close there for my opening comments. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Stephanie. You have also given us much um, fodder for discussion. Um, thank you for your, for your comments. Um, Diane, why don't we go to you? Thank you, Duinka. It's a really a pleasure to be here. I want to thank UCLA, American Indian Studies, and most certainly Beth Ribbit and Repair for um, organizing this wonderful panel. Um, I'm speaking from Nooksack uh, and Upper Skagit lands in Upper Washington, where I've made my home for the last 20 years. So I want to acknowledge the land that um, I'm. Um, part of at this moment in time. I'm Tanana Athabaskan. Um, over 20 years ago now, um, actually, I wrote a piece called Policing the Res, Keeping No Peace in Indian Country. And I want to offer a couple of my observations from that old article that I wrote when I was in graduate school, mainly because I want to talk about the continuity of the horror of this situation that continuously um, endangers our families, our relatives. And I, I also feel like there's a way in which you cannot evoke health. Um, and if I have been really heavily involved in um, doing research around health, what is health? for American Indian Alaska Native peoples. Um, I have to look at this environment of violence that is ongoing. So this is um, some observations I made 20 years ago. You're gonna see some big continuities, of course, with Sarah's. Um, I'm really happy that Sarah brought these um, uh, numbers up because um, some of these uh, are directly linked to that. Basically, one of the biggest things I observed that um, we are policed. American Indian, Alaska Native peoples are policed, but never protected. In 1999, when I started that research, violence perpetrated against American Indian, Alaska Native peoples was two times higher than all the other populations across all age groups. 50% of American Indian Alaska Native women had an endured an assault higher than any other racialized population at that time. Native men and women had significantly been affected. They were suffering debility at higher rates, 21.9% than any other population of people in the US. Native women had suffered most with 21.8% of all American Indian Alaska Native women at that time unable to carry out everyday tasks. And I wanna tie that old observation of mine into Jasper Poire's argument about the right to maim. Her newest work is, um, is called um, The Right to Maim, Debility, Capacity, and Disability, in which she ties it uh, into the way in which marginalized populations are harmed so that they are not um, able to uh, effectively govern or protect or uh, live in, in a good way. So policed, but not protected. There was an atmosphere for, for this that um, I was really interested in and continue to be interested in. 
basically the feds, the states, state legislators actually rely on <laughs> rely on or ignore carry a blind eye to offer you know you you probably leave a little explicit, right? And I like that he's saying I'm not gonna take you home because yeah. you're too drunk. I try to leave you probably explicit probably. No. Excuse me, we have a Can you hear me? Okay, I'll finish my uh, comments really quickly here. It's just that this occurs on and off reservation in an atmosphere of permission uh, in which fed state legislators, uh, locals rely or ignore often masses jurisdiction holes. They often work out of them by giving locals permission offered a bli blind eye to beatings, maimings, killings, and um, to leave people with a loss, a lack of sense of safety or control over their own lives and lands, which ties in to a point where I think all of us want to get to. And also now and then in 1999, and even now the huge proliferation of anti-Indian groups allowed to flourish. Again, I'm also going to evoke Ruth Gilmore by just saying that in terms of what we're talking about here, I see then as now, this is the state sanctioned and or extra legal production and exploitation of a group differentiated vulnerability to death. And we deserve better. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Um, again, super helpful opening comments. Um, I'm looking forward to our open discussion, but first let's go to Sandy. Am I up? You're up. Okay. <laughs> When they first asked me about this panel, um, I was hesitant to say yeah. And the biggest reason is my experience, uh, most of my research has been on violence against indigenous women and sex trafficking of in indigenous women. And in that work, the, um, on a grand scale, the police did not help us. Police were not there. Um, they were sometimes complicit, they were definitely unconcerned, and the response to a victim was often that she was a waste of their time. And the trauma that comes from that, when you look at it on a grand scale, is you've not just got the trauma of, this, of the injury or the experience, you have the pain that follows, you have injury that handicaps people their whole lives. I can't tell you how many trafficking victims I've talked to who can't walk normally, who can't get in and out of the bathtub, who can't do so many of the things that we take for granted. And they live with their memory of all that was done to them their whole lives. And they, they work to heal from it and all that. So I had a difficult time think, looking at policing from way back from a distance view, from a more um, objective view. And the one thing that changed the way I thought to some degree was I was working in Minneapolis and I was working on that report, Shattered Hearts. And I met a law officer, Grant Snyder, who was astonishing. Grant worked, he would do observation. He would think he had some juveniles being trafficked. He'd watch the, um, the apartment and have a photo tel a telephoto lens. And then he would go in and knock on the door. And the first thing he said was, you're not in trouble to the girls who were in prostitution. And he say, I'm only concerned about helping you be safe. 
And the way he worked with them, he fought for victimless prosecution where the victim did not have to face her perpetrator and testify. And he, those young women, I don't think he's doing that work now anymore. They stayed, they were his friends and they told him he was their friend. That's the kind of policing that I would aim for and the kind that empowers, that supports, that protects. That has not been what I witnessed and personally it has not been what I've experienced. And I believe that's the direction we need to go. Thank you so much, Sandy. Okay, well, we have um, lots of important questions have been raised, I think about, um, you know, the, the role of policing and um, the relationship to sovereignty um, and certainly around questions of, of violence against women and sexual violence. Um, I, I wonder if we want to just um, take a step back before jumping into like the profound issues that have been raised so far and maybe just address um, a couple kind of foundational questions. So I'm just going to throw these out there and you guys could respond to whatever you want in relation to them. Um, so when we, we had an earlier conversation in preparation for this webinar, and one of the questions that we raised was just what, what do we mean by policing? What is policing for us? Because some people talk about policing in different ways and mean, sometimes mean different things. And how has policing become been you know, an, an inextricable element of colonization? So what's the kind of, just to kind of historicize this a bit, how, what, what is the role over the history of colonization has, what has been the role of policing? So if anyone would like to speak to either of those questions, I'll open it up. Well, I'd say if I look at it through a colonized lens, um, I'd say it's the control of potential and actual um, bad actors. And the methods used are oppression, disempowerment, intimidation, and isolation. Mm -hmm. and traditional communities and tribal communities, traditional lens, it's a community-wide responsibility. And what the mainstream would call prevention, that's my experience anyway, but that mm -hmm. centers on inclusion and empowerment, and it promotes participation, collaboration, cooperation in relationships and social structures and collective decisions. Those are light years apart. Mm -hmm. I'll add, um that you know, I'm a I'm a old criminal law professor, so um, I tend to look at cases and statutes. And I think one of the most important things to think about in the context of Indian law and Indian reservations is the Crow Dog case from the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. At the time that that um, case came about, basically it was a murder case. It was a homicide between two uh, Lakota chiefs, and um, well, one killed the other, and it was resolved by the people in their way. And um, the, the local white community was outraged by that outcome because they saw this pretty significant tribal penalty as being a true slap on the wrist. Mm -hmm. So the federal government tried to prosecute him in federal court. Mm -hmm. And my students are always shocked to learn that he won that case. So Crow Dog, who was um, held accountable by his own people and then prosecuted by the federal government, um, was released by the US Supreme Court. But just two years later, Congress passed the Major Crimes Act. And that is the law that is still in effect on most reservations in the lower 48 today. And what that means is the federal government, that is the FBI and the US attorneys are tasked with responding to violent crime in Indian country. And that's still the law today. So. When we think about that and the US attorney's role in the 21st century, I see well, we have an obligation to provide this kind of crime control through federal law enforcement and federal prosecution. But that's not why the law was passed. The Major Crimes Act was passed to punish bad Indians like Crow Dog that the white community hated. And so we're still operating with yeah. that system like right now in Oklahoma, my reservation was recently re-recognized by the Supreme Court. So the federal government is now taking these violent crimes that are happening within Oklahoma. But that was not a victim-centered law. It was, it was deliberately 
passed to give the federal government law enforcement authority in Indian country. And we see the results in the high rates of victimization and over incarceration. I think about policing um, in general as an outcome of property protection, mm -hmm. uh, property protections by the state uh, for certain um, crimes always point to a protection of um, a um, capitalist necessity to protect property over lives or people. Um, but that's like really, you know, that's at its most abstract. But when I think about it in Indian country, I think about it, you know, all the way from the beginning, of course, when the extraction from Indian country, okay, begins um, with the taking of lands and resources. Uh, most generally, there is the con there's more of a concern, I, I believe, just like, um, you know, we're saying here, um, there's more of a concern about actually protecting the property of the United States than any of the people. I think that also for me, policing has always had this larger, rather than just the police themselves, you know, I really think that um, it's really, you know, um, it's, it's most important to, to, to not lose sight of the ways in which um, the jurisdictions have been so scrambled in Indian country, which it became popularly known as the maze of, uh, in, the maze of injustice, <laughs> um, thwarted any efforts, uh, any sovereign efforts by native uh, nations to protect themselves. Uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, very much um, just adding on to what you said, Diane, there about when I think of like the question, what is what is policing? What does that mean? What, what are we talking about? Um, the title of this this webinar is Indigenous um, Insights on Policing. I think very much about an, an in, as an institution established to protect white settler property interests, like Diane was saying. Um, to safeguard the rights of exclusion so that, you know, I put a fence around this and it's mine, not yours. So that needs the kind of force of the state. Um, it also policing, police as an institution, as well as policing, which is how you and I and everyone like treats each other, right? The kind of regulated social policing is to maintain relationships of domination, right? So um, we do this through the policing of, um, I'm a gender study scholar, through uh, gender performance and sexuality, performance of sexuality. We do this through um, a lot of native communities do a, a kind of a informal or formal policing of what is traditional or what is a value, right? Um, and we really, those fall along often these lines, uh, imposed settler lines of um, how to value and treat a human being. And so we have the institution of police that protects property and um, also facilitates ongoing dispossession through their protection of extractive economy. Of course, we see, you know, the um, barricades and all that put up by, in Unistoten trying to protect their territories, right? We saw it at Standing Rock, we see it at Bears Ears, we're seeing it in um, Mauna Kea, we see it in all these places where the police function to safeguard the expansion of capital. Um, but also like we all, you hear that phrase a lot on Twitter stuff like kill the cop in your head, right? This idea that like I myself enact a form of hegemonic policing um, by imposing a, a kind of force morality on how I value others, right? So there's me myself and how I function as a subject of this empire and how I police others. And then there's actual institutions, men with badges and guns who do this kind of um, legal, like terror, terror in our lives. Um, so I think about policing in both of those ways. Okay, well, you know, let's, um, I think it, let's go to the heart of one of the questions that I think is in play here. I mean, we've, we've said, um, you all have said quite eloquently, you know, that, that policing is, you know, um, a fundamental part of the 
colonial process of settler dispossession of settler, you know, the construction of settler sovereignty, right, and native dispossession of um, capitalist property, private property you know, relations. Um, so, and and I think you know, you've said several of you have said quite clearly that policing is, you know at best um, useless in terms of helping with problems of violence and at worst, uh, you know, itself is very violent, right, for our communities. And there's a kind of um, violent harm that takes place, not just through direct kind of physical violence on people, but in the kind of violence of breaking down our ways of relating to each other and um, in that process. Um, Yet at the same time, um, you know, Sarah laid out some pretty stark statistics about violence against women, for example. Um, and there's in this question of whether, you know, the, the heart of the matter is about the federal government imposing its, you know, sovereignty over native nations sovereignty um, through this and the ju jurisdictional morass and what have you. Um, is there, so, do, for tribal sovereignty, then is it better to have that control and ju that jurisdictional and police control be in the hands of tribes, or is all policing, by definition, negative? What what do people want to weigh in on this question? Because I, when we uh, have a, an ongoing abolition discussion at UCLA, and several people um, who work in Indian country said, look. You don't understand in Indian country, we don't need less policing. We need more to stop violence against native women. Um, and they, I mean, they have arguments for that position. So I'm wondering what you yes. all think about that. It's a pattern that crosses not just Indian country, but the nation because I know I'm old enough to remember when we had art in school, when we had music in school, or sports <laughs> were free, where the supports for the libraries, we could go to the library after school if you had a parent who worked. Those are gone, e even without COVID. Those are gone, that funding has been gutted. So we don't have positive supports and guidance for the children across the country. And of course that's disproportionate. The families who have the least access to go pay for it are those who suffer the most. But we now have criminalization of, in schools, we have school resource officers. Kids get into a pushy pushy, that's an assault. And it's charged as an assault. Um, somebody steals a teacher's hat and throws it, that's robbery. And I was hearing that in Minneapolis. So many kids were coming into court, juvenile court, for having committed crimes. And they were kid behavior. But there, it's, it is criminalizing kid behavior. But now we have this. The kids themselves view the law enforcement as the enemy. And they rebel against that. So we're just digging this deeper hole where if we did go back to our own traditions, which is support for the kids, a big circle, a big family. Um, so they don't, so the conflict is unresolvable conflict is not the norm. But when I look at how as a nation, this country treats its children in general and its children of color, especially American Indians, so wrong we're in this deep hole that we got to get out of. I just um, recently finished a, a short foreword for a collection of my tribe's first written laws. Um, they were written down in 1824, which is quite early um, mm -hmm. for a, a tribal government to have written statutes. And they were written in English because at that time we didn't even have a written language yet. Um, and most of the laws are criminal in nature. So they prohibit certain kinds of activity, provide for sanctions and, that, and the like. And we were a heavily assimilated tribe at that point as well, heavily Christianized and heavily intermarried. Most of our uh, surnames are like Macintosh and McGirt and things like that. Um, and it was very clear why we wrote those laws down. We wrote those laws down to try to keep people off our back. Who are telling us if you want to be civilized you have to have a legal system just mm -hmm. like ours otherwise we're not going to treat you as civilized and within those first written laws there is a runaway slave 
Act, which rewarded Creek citizens for returning black slaves to the tribe. Um, there was um, uh, there was punishment for women who committed adultery, but not for men. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know that all those laws are emanating from traditional you know, conceptions of how people relate to one another. They were written down to try to get the feds off our back. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when the Western system, when the American system has said, we will recognize you as a nation, we will recognize you as a tribe, but you have to do X, Y, Z. And so it's in a struggle to survive because recognition is a component of sovereignty. I mean, if you're, nobody recognizes you as a sovereign, then it's hard to be one. But it's like, we've had to compromise, right? Our, our traditional ways of organizing and relating to one another mm -hmm. so that we can keep them off our back. And so we've been funded, funding tribal police, funding tribal jails. It's all coming from the federal government, right? And I'll just say one more thing about sort of the contemporary issues, you know, the native women have been taking care of each other for, for centuries. And we've been helping, you know, women who've been battered or raped, we've been doing that, but there was never any funding for it. Women were doing it out of their basements, out of their closets, underground pickup railroad, you know, all kinds of things to help each other. And then finally, the Violence Against Women Act is passed in 1994. For the first time, these native women who've been doing it for no pay, <laughs> now have a salary for the first time, now have health care, insurance, retirement, right? For the first time. And so, yes, there's an instinct. We need that money to better organize on the ground. But it came at, as a, it came at a price. And the price was you will continue to assimilate your systems. You will act like the state acts if you want the money. And I think that we have to acknowledge that. I, I do acknowledge that. And I think that that's the trouble that there's, you know, this constant translation that's going, uh, we keep trying to translate between um, the prerogatives of the state and the prerogatives of our, of our own hearts, perhaps, because I really, I'm trying to think, you know, through in terms of to return to what our, were our systems of care at one time. Um, were they perfect? No, because I, you know, came from a place, uh, Ninana, um, that definitely had, uh, at least in, not in my lifetime, but in my mother's lifetime, some semblance of what had been their system of order. And, um, it was very heavily integrated with their life on the land, which was destroyed in my lifetime, uh, or m partially destroyed my lifetime to the extent that there aren't hardly any families like there were when I were little that completely lived off the land. Well, the land once disciplined us, okay? And, and I mean this um, very, very directly, the land once disciplined us because the land taught it, not only gave us our food, it also took the food away if we were so foolish as to mistreat it. If we were so foolish as to mistreat each other, then we had less hands to help us and we lost members or we lost actual mothers to families or we, you know, there's all kinds of ways in which actual, you know, families were, are at the very beginning of what we mean by sovereignty. Uh, because what I think we mean by sovereignty is not a power over, but a power from within. It's that, it's that heart knowing, you know what I'm saying? Um, that there is a sense that we share among each other. And we were talking about that. I'm really glad that Steph brought that up. Stephanie brought that up. It's just that we all might have a sense of right or wrong, but as groups, you know what I'm saying? Um, people don't always agree on what that right or wrong is. And so what I've seen happen in my um, several years alive on earth now is this real breakdown among our families about being able also to care for each other. Some part of it is because um, just like um, Sandy said, you know what I'm saying? There's, well, it's not only, there's an erosion of knowing what we believe in, sometimes at a local level, 
that we can operate together as systems of care. There's also a total abandonment of the state in terms of, you know, and has been for a really long time, a total of actual abandonment of the state of any kind of support for systems of care in our communities. And like Sandy said, in other communities across the United States, especially communities of color, black communities. So going into what I'm saying, I'm saying, I think that we, part of it has to probably be that we're not, I, I think I agree with Coulthard, with Glenn Coulthard, that recognition itself cannot give us sovereignty. And then I think the sovereignty is going to have to be grown from our retaking our power from our system right into, right down to the, the roots of our systems of care. So I'm going to jump out and let everybody else sit. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Maria. I just wanted to add what you said, Diane, about, about care. And I know when we were pre preparing for this uh, webinar, we talked a lot about care. And to me, that's so telling. Um, so the question, um, Shannon, I wrote it down, that what you said earlier. So it seems like police are at best useless, <laughs> at their very best. <laughs> and I'm going to make t-shirts, and you're in for it now. But uh, <laughs> uh, stickers, I got the whole plan. But police at, the, at their best function are useless, right? And at their worst, they actively do harm. They actively traffic. They actively harass and belittle and humiliate and harm the most vulnerable in our already vulnerable communities, right? So that can't be it, right? Like they can't be like, well, I hope they do nothing, right? Um, <laughs> like that seems like a losing game. Um, so, for me, the, I'm very cognizant of um, as someone who works with incarcerated folks and who is a part of living person in the world and has people in my life who have been subject to this kind of violence and, and who want justice, who want, who want to know why we failed them. I'm very cognizant of the, of the statistics that Sarah shared at the beginning. They're so important to realize the rate of victimization and, and how precarious um, Native women's um, trans and queer folks in especially how precarious those lives are. But to that call for more police, that kind of like common sense call, like, well, actually Indian lands are under police. We need more police. Um, to that call, I would say, you're asking the wrong question, right? Like, do you want more police or do you want an end to men's violence? Do you want more police or do you want a community that gives a damn about you? Yeah. Do you want more police or do you want to feel held and seen? Do you want to feel like your life matters to others? Do you want a role in your community where you belong, right? Because that's a very different conversation. Police really forecloses that conversation and it, and it ends up with like more, you know, geeks and badges. And like, I don't, that's not what's going to make life livable for us. What's going to make life livable is each other. And so we can build this capacity if we know that that's what we want. Um, the police is a dead end game. <laughs> if at the best we're hoping they do nothing, right? Um, I also want to say that um, this, this kind of horse trading or deal with the devil, it seems like we kind of make like that tribal nations do police, do courts, do jailing, do all the things to be legible and, and gain the recognition from a state to that, I would say, I understand the seduction of recognition. I understand the, the very real material resources that come with it. Um, and that seems like too good to let go of to people who have fought so hard and so long for so little. Um, but I guess I will say that we must turn away from that seduction of empire. We have to turn away and we have to turn toward each other and maybe they don't recognize us, but I will say I don't recognize the state if the cost is the most vulnerable people in my life. I don't recognize them. So I need to turn toward you all. Like we need to look at each other and we look better than they do anyway. I'd rather look at you um, than look <laughs> at the state. <laughs> and, and I think you're right. I think that um, we, we, at least in my experience when working on reservations with victim services, we don't often ask, well, what do you want? And 
when that question is asked, it's very often, I don't, I'm in, I, I love my partner. I just want the violence to stop, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and we don't often ask that question. I'm currently engaged in some empirical work where I've interviewed over 50 native women and two spirit people who survived rape. And I asked them, what is justice to you? Mm -hmm. Does that mean we lock him up and throw away the key? Does it mean we hug it out with grandma or anything in between, the, you know, anything in between? And the answers are, are fascinating and it's too premature to give you specific trends, but I can just tell you the conversations have been very, very rich. And I've learned a lot about creative, you know, innovative ideas for dealing with violence against women in tribal communities. And I hope all have that monograph out sometime soon, but um, the conversations, that's what we need to do. We need to ask people who we would assume would want a police officer to respond and ask them, what would you really want? Like if you could start from scratch, mm -hmm. what would it look like? Mm -hmm. Let's talk more about that. I mean, I think, <clears throat> you know, given what we've said so far about, you know, the ways that kind of recognition and federal assistance kind of you know, systematically forced us into what out of our own systems and into Western models and continue to do that today. And what Diane has said about the ways that are, you know, increasing dispossession, disconnection from the land and from the, the structures of society that gave us other systems for, um, for handling problems that arose. Um, how, you know, how can we, you know, do what Stephanie you know, so poignantly said in, in turning to each other, like how, what, what can we devise that are our own systems um, for rendering some, something that resembles justice, right? And for ending violence. Um, and then just to throw a wrench in that happy thought, um, <laughs> how, so given what Sarah said at the beginning about, uh, you know, the, the, the high percentage of perpetrators who are non-native, how do we bring them to justice in those systems where we're looking to each other when they don't buy into any of that, right? Or they don't, and they don't need to because they're from the dominant powerful group in societies. Does anyone have thoughts on any of that? Well, um, yes, I think that's, that's, a, that's a, a linchpin issue that I'm working on right now with our own um, tribal nation. Um, and um, we don't, in 1978, the Supreme Court ruled that tribes could not prosecute non-Indians um, for any crime, child rape, murder, anything. Happens on a reservation, committed by a non-Indian, no jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And so we've gone and asked Congress to fix that. And again, it comes with strings attached. It comes with strings attached that you will operate like a mini version of the state court. But then I think about if there are, if, if we create systems or revitalize systems or strengthen systems of traditional responses to violence, right? Whether that looks like a peacemaking model that comes from the Navajo system or other forms of traditional dispute resolution, do we bring non-Indians into that circle? Is that an appropriate place for us to resolve their violence? I mean, I think it's going to be a different answer for whoever the offender is and whatever the tribal community is. But if if we want to address that non-Indian violence on our lands, on our, our reservations, then what do we do with the non-Indian offenders? You know, is that a space that they're welcomed into? I think that's a really difficult question and one that we have to confront because the violence committed by non-Indians is just so per per pervasive and profound. Oh, yes. <laughs> I so agree with you. I really think that's the big question too, mainly because that's the reason I brought up policing the res. Because what has not changed in 20 years is the fact that they can rely on that violence by the surrounding populations to police us. So it is not, you know, so I'm saying just that they are bad little boys and girls or, you know, or whatever they, uh, it's not that, it's that um, they actually are, are part of an actual mindset, you know what I'm saying, that gets its way. It doesn't always get its way through the law. It gets its way through the lack of law. It gets its way because we don't have jurisdiction. 
uh, it gets its way because everybody can all the way up to the legislators at the port at the point that um, I wrote that article, I think Gorton was still alive and that's who I was talking about Parr and Spion and all those guys, you know what I'm saying? Well, has that gotten any better? No, the militias have proliferated if anything and more people are armed at this point. <laughs> so that's real. So I'm like totally, you know, hearing what you are saying, you know what I'm saying? Um, it's not just a matter of whether or not we can take care of and reintroduce clan systems, for instance, you know what I'm saying, uh, in, and, and hold people accountable through our kinship systems, which is something, you know what I'm saying, a lot of us feel like has to be part of the, you know, has to be part of any solution, for sure. I can see how it is that um, basically the way in which our families got split up is because we are we have been impoverished to the uh, point where our families split up and have had to go off to get um, jobs elsewhere, et cetera. So we're just not literally not living together as a unit uh, to or cohesive as a unit as actual you know tribal identifications might be something like you can say I'm da 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 but what does that mean to you you know how when's the last time you know what I'm saying that you took care of each other as you know your as your people uh, and and I think that actually has to be confronted too but I also think that um, hugely different now than when I first did that research uh, in the 1990s, is that class systems have reared their ugly heads in so that some of us, even though I may have started out as somebody in foster homes and you know what I'm saying and, and having kind of a rough time or whatever with uh, two kids and no husband and all that good stuff, but my own choice. But, but nevertheless, you, you know what I'm saying? It's that um, we, are there at that point where we're not any longer, you know what I'm saying, in cohesive systems to take care of each other. So that's something that has to be confronted. Um, so, you know, 20 years ago, that was, um, that was the fact of life, okay? That we were moving that way, that the class systems um, that are among us right now are also, um, making a big dent in how cohesive we are. Some of us who ended up getting educations, you know what I'm saying, can sit here and maybe say this because we have got safe homes. But I know there's a lot of my relatives tonight that aren't, it wouldn't be able to join this conversation. You know what I'm saying? Because they're in a dire way. So that, that's what's really happening too. I think a lot, so I think uh, you raised two questions, Shannon, and yeah, I'm really thinking about what Sarah and Diane said. Um, so one, the first part of that question seemed to be like, what are we to do in our own communities? What are our capacities? So I think that's where very much like, you know, you can, there's all those um, abolitionist kind of syllabi and workshop things and handbooks <laughs> that go around online. Um, that are so, so helpful for how do we build collective capacity, those kinds of questions. So for me, those are always really inspirational, usually penned by you know, incredible black feminist thinkers. Um, uh, yeah, so I think a lot about those. But for me, that question is like how to build capacities of care in our community. So if we're imagining our community being either an urban or a reservation kind of tribal community, a hub of some kind, right? Um, so how do we build those capacities? One, I would ask a question that we, we all as individuals and also in our institutions or our collectives or nonprofits or however we're organized, we need to ask ourselves, what's standing in the way of care, right? Like what is a barrier to care? So is that homelessness, which is a very serious issue, right? For, for native people um, and others. And then, or is it, you know, addiction issues and there's no services without incarceration, right? Like the, the drunk tank becomes the only rehab in town, right? 
Um, <laughs> is it a lack of access to food and like desperation that's driving like petty crime, right? Like petty theft. You know, what is, what is our barrier to really caring for one another? And I think once we start asking those questions, we'll realize our capacities, right? Because it turns out we do have, um, I mean, I'm speaking from the position as being a Hooper person, but this tribe does have resources, does have things they can do. And in fact, they are already organized around certain aspects of care. I'm thinking of youth centers. I'm thinking of, you know, tribal TANF programs. I'm thinking of um, a lot of us do cultural uh, projects where we do youth outreach for like suicide prevention and wellness. Like a lot of us have capacity. So how do we build collective capacity? And when do we start having these conversations? This is very much from uh, Ruthie Gilmore's, what her, she has so many quotable moments, but um, these phrases like, organize with people who are already organized. So <laughs> many of us are already organized around specific things in our communities. How do we like expand those, um, what's Mashana always say? Extend those rafters, right? It's a hot <laughs> Mashana thing. We don't do rafters where I'm from. But, uh, <laughs> but like, how do we extend those capacities to build more capacity for care? Um, so I think there are real practical solutions to all of that. Um, and that's where the elbow grease comes in. So it's not all woo-woo feel goods. It's also like roll up your sleeves because there's work to be done here um, and get in where you fit in, right? Some of us are tired of doing all of it. Um, so where are we already organized, right? <laughs> Native women in the room raise their hand. We're tired of doing all of it, Native men. Um, so then the next thing would be, um, so that's like what's standing in our way. Um, the other serious question is how do we address violence done to Indian people by non-Indians, what do we do, right? What are, what are we to do about that? And I guess for me, it's another series of questions. And I regard that very seriously. Um, of course, a lot of non-Indian men who do violence in, to Indian women and queer folks and children are married and they're the father, they're the patriarch of the family, right? This is my own experience. So that question becomes a little different when you start thinking of it in your family versus like, you know, bumps in the night or whatever. So one is, it's our own family. So how do we make our families well when we have these non-native men in our families who are um, abusive and menacing and all the terrible things? Um, how do we heal that, right? Like, what do we, how do we address that harm? Um, the other is, where is this violence happening? Is it happening because girls don't have access, young women, from work to home safely? Like, is it happening because of, um, a lack of, of community and care, right? Is it like, how are, where are the sites where this is happening and how can we make an intervention there? Like sometimes it boils down uh, to something as common sense as like, I couldn't afford the ride home, right? And so then I was vulnerable out at night and that's where violence happens. Um, also, we need to be anti-capitalist as well as anti-police in our organizing. Up here, there's the cannabis industry, and then we see skyrocketing numbers of violence against Native women and girls. So where is this happening? Where capitalism circulates, like where capital circulates the most densely, right? Um, that's where this happens. So, you know, the, the, there's many answers to that question, and they're very serious, and I, I want to regard them carefully. But they are, all, I think, are also strategies that don't necessarily be like, and then we found this perpetrator and we hugged it out and we did it in like a good way or, you know, how, <laughs> how we say that. Um, sometimes it's just how do we intervene in the spots where settlers harm those of us um, repeatedly over and over again? And how do we make sure those of us exposed to harm aren't, aren't anymore? Um, and for me, again, that's a lot of those are practical solutions. Like how, how do we making sure that everyone gets home safely, that you know, how do we address homelessness and et cetera? I'll, I'll end it there, but. Sounds great, thanks Stephanie. My head is going in many directions. <laughs> um, there have to be, at a community level, we need resources. Um, there's no place for, her, for a victim to live. There's nowhere for her kids to be safe. There's no safe space. That's resources. Um, my first thought when you said, what about um, non-native um, violent perpetrators? My first thought was exile. You need <laughs> sovereignty to do that. Mm -hmm. Sovereignty over your land and your 
borders and everything to um, go against the force of the US government because they still have jurisdiction over a lot of our lands. So what's the limit on sovereignty? Because Siri, I'm not joking when I said exile. I've got, uh, oh. I've got somebody in my community who is doing terrible damage and doesn't want to change and wants to keep doing it because he's having fun or she is having fun out. So I'm kind of a hard ass on that. Um, I'm seeing way too many, um, I don't, it's not a mental health label. I've seen too many violent perpetrators who are doing what they do because they're having fun. And that's really what's going on. They're having fun. Their definition of fun may not be mine or yours or anybody's. Um, and I understand mental illness. I've seen a lot of it. I've had experience with it. But there are folks who do who are mean and cruel because they're having a good time. It's a, a twisted kind of logic. What do you do with those people? And how do you, if they're from our own community, how do we support them toward healing? Or exile was, at least in my own community, it was something you did. They, they were booted if they would not contribute to the well-being of the community. So there have to be teeth. It, it can't be punishment, because punishment is counter to healing and wellness and working together. But that, that tip off between resources to support somebody who's trying to escape a situation or avoid a situation and resources for somebody who wants to change their behavior. Where do those come from? You Is know, traditionally, um, one of the punishments for a violent activity among Creek people was corporal punishment. Was what? Corporal punishment, mm -hmm. whipping. And so if we're talking about like, let's revitalize some of our traditional principles in the 21st century, right? What, what, what would that look like, you know? And so I think we have to be forward looking. We may have done some things in the past that worked well in that time and in that context, mm -hmm. but do we really want to whip people now, you know? And so we have to be not just saying, what did we do 500 years ago? Because we didn't have very much violence then because a lot of those things don't make sense in a contemporary setting. So that's another challenge I think we have is like, okay, we, we had corporal punishment and maybe that helped help keep people in line, but I'm not sure, I'm not comfortable mm -hmm. with the idea of implementing that in a contemporary world. I would agree very with well with the care ethic. Time, um, to be whipped in public way back then would have been a horrifically humiliating experience. So, you it know- It was a deterrent. Yeah. Where does shame come in? When does the pressure of your community esteem come in? When's it more important than the actual punishment? Yeah, I think too, I wonder, um, so I'm a prison abolitionist. I'm a believer in the abolition of of police and human caging and warehousing. I am a, a believer in the abolition of the United States actually. So it's fascinating to be at this political moment where perhaps we see the end of empire on the horizon. But um, this is my own hope for the future. Join me, won't you? Um, but also I think, I think people, desperate people do desperate things. And I think people who have been consistently abandoned and wounded and left alone with no sense of belonging in their community. I'm talking about native people here also. Um, I think often get stuck, they're, um, they're tragic people really because they're so wounded that they, they do more harm and it becomes a really vicious cycle of harm and violence in our communities, um, native or not. And I guess for me, kind of, kind of to come back to that discussion of providing capacities for care. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in that if we provide care, if we are vulnerable and generous in our spirits um, and provide care and belonging to people, that that harm will stop. In the meantime, for me, I'm less concerned with punishment and like repercussion or whatever for, for people who do harm. 
um, because usually that gets us to a conversation where it's managed by a tribal entity or by the state or a state acting tribal entity. And that has not produced any result that I'm interested in. And so really rather I'm about reducing harm, reducing the, the possibility for harm to happen to me, to people I love, to vulnerable people in my community that I haven't met, right? Um, loved ones that I don't know. Um, I'm about reducing their kind of vulnerability to harm and also extending networks of care to them. And I truly believe that if, if we invest in that, invest in ourselves in that way, not to use that kind of capitalist language, but if we do that, then we'll see an end of violence in our communities, that that will be the end um, of that colonial legacy. I, I, I believe it, I have to. I think you're right. I think that it's not too late, right? Tribal nations have not been party to the prison industrial complex very long. And, and many have not entered into it. Many tribes do not police and, and prosecute their own people. And, and we have the unique opportunity as tribal people to craft solutions that don't mimic the worst traits of Western law and order. We have that privilege, in fact, you know, not very many communities can say that in the United States, but we can build different kinds of communities. We may not get federal funding for it, but we are, it's not too late. I don't think it's too late to back out of what has happened in the last 50 years, which is adopt state code and put a badge on somebody, you know? We've, been, we've only been doing that for a few decades. And I, I think it, I don't think it's too late to rethink it. I think we have to challenge ourselves to do that. I think I've actually seen a good example in a film that I saw, um, recently, I think it was about Kurok or Yurok, and it was about their tribal court system. Mm -hmm. And it was about this very uh, thing about what do we do when someone has caused harm, you know, inside their family. But what impressed me is, is that I don't want to give up either. I think we're really different. I think the communities are all very, very different, you know, and I think I have to always keep that in mind. And they do have different capacities. They certainly have different incomes, uh, income levels. You know, I can see really differences just even in the area that I live in right now between those who have successful casinos, for instance, and those who have not entered that uh, realm or, or aren't um, work, you know, they're, it's not there. So, but that's not it. What I saw in that film was I saw a community that cared about each other. You know what I'm saying? Or it was small enough to actually know these were not, um, they, they weren't strangers, they actually knew each other. And so the level of care there, right from the judge on down, I thought of you when I saw that judge. Anyway, <laughs> like, or I see it in, in somebody like uh, Montoya Lewis, you know, a Judge Montoya here in Washington state. I see that level of care that you don't often see um, inside the system sometimes too, when they have the community is inside them. You know what I'm saying? That, the, that they're not just carrying out um, the predilections of the state, they're carrying out the predilections of the community. I wonder if we could um, pivot a little bit before we open it up for questions from the audience. Um, what, what Stephanie was, was just saying um, and, and raised in the beginning but, um, about the police encounter last night, the tragic um, encounter in Philadelphia and, and what you're saying about people who have suffered harm and then are harming others or people who are people who are not well because of the way our society treats us, right? Um, you know, we have a mental health crisis in this country and it's responded to with policing. So I wonder if anyone wants to speak to that. What, what should our response to mental health issues look like? How could we do this differently in our communities? And then just to kind of um, bring us into the current moment of kind of that I think is an important um, discussion happening all across this country around policing um, because of the Black Lives Matter movement raising in particular police violence against black men and killing of black men. And I wonder if anyone has thoughts on the relationship or the significance of the Black Lives Matter movement for indigenous communities and including um, indigenous, black, black indigenous people. So two different questions again. Thank you. 
Well, we have to address anti-Black racism espoused by Native people, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Good place um, to start. We have to, we have to name it, we have to call it out. It's, it's pervasive and it's unacceptable. Um, and I'm coming from a former slave owning tribe that has disenfranchised and denaturalized freedmen citizens. And okay. I don't think we can have a really honest conversation with our own communities and within our own communities about police brutality and police killings if we are espousing anti-Black racism within the tribe. And so that's really important to me. And in my experience, Black Lives Matter matters organizers pay close attention to indigeneity. Now they're, they're, I, heard, I heard somebody say, well, BLM doesn't care about native people. I'm like that's not been my experience at all. Um, and we do owe them a debt of gratitude for the hard work that they've done to raise the visibility of this issue, not just for black people, but for all people of color, all marginalized communities. But we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, I think about anti-blackness is to the United, it's constitutive of the United States, right? So I think when native peoples are so short-sighted and frankly lazy in their thinking to not um, really interrogate how anti-blackness shows up in our governance, in our, uh, I don't know, everyday relationships to one another, in our families, um, largely about institutional structures though. When native people fail to interrogate that, what they're doing is helping to build a settler state that is hell bent on their dispossession. Yeah. So way to do the job for them, like you're doing like all the heavy lifting. So I often think that, um, and I'm thinking a lot about um, Tiffany King's beautiful work, uh, the Black Shoals, of course, um, also talks I've seen, I've had the privilege of watching uh, her give at, uh, American Studies and NASA talking about how anti-Blackness kind of animates or is a mechanism through which settler colonialism functions. So mm -hmm. the two things for me, um, the relationship between you know decolonization or decolonial futurities and those efforts that in critical Indigenous studies scholars and activists and community members do every day, the relationship between that and Black Lives Matter for me is common sense. It's mm -hmm. It's not, um, it's not something we have to make two incommensurate things work together. Like these, these things are mirrors. They, as we have always done historically, politically, we've always fed off of each other's movements um, and built real solidarity, real coalition, real change, real meaningful change. Um, and, um, and I think about that a lot, again, about uh, Ruthie Gilmore's talk yesterday talking about this relationship between abolition and decolonization. And I know UCLA has put on uh, another talk um, uh, with uh, Ruthie Gilmore, with Sarah Haley, with Nick Estes and all that. So this is like on a lot of our minds right now. And for me, um, that's for a reason. It's because it makes perfect sense. And when you're facing, when your enemy is the, the state, you know, lowercase s and uppercase s, <laughs> the state California and the state, you know, the United States, nation states, um, you need more people in your fight. And so you should organize where people are already organized and we're, we're natural allies. Um, and we think our best together and we'll come up with, no one could articulate freedom better, I think, than black and indigenous peoples together. Um, and so I'm, I really look forward to more collaboration and I urge other native people who haven't done that work already to, to really look to the leadership that BLM has provided us um, and to look inward in our own communities and how we can be better, better kin, better kin to those um, in those movements. Thank you, that, that's so well put. Um, I was part of the movements in the sixties and I really feel like people have not, a lot of people forgot how actually close we were, that there was a lot of organizing going on between black and, and native communities at that time. And you were right there. It, a lot of it has actually, people have forgotten, you know, or forgotten how close we were or at one time or what we had learned from each other. 
But there was a movement at that time around nationalism that I, I don't want to forget either. And one of the things that happened was like people like Vine Deloria Jr. said, you know, wanted to differentiate, you know, the um, fight against race, you know what I'm saying? And, the, and, and actually separate it from articulating what sovereignty was at that time. It says, it's, we're, you know, we're not a race, we're nations. And it doesn't make sense in this time. And so I'm glad we've gone back because I also am extremely interested in the conversations that we're having with each other now. It made me really proud and happy to have uh, one of my daughter's families for sure be in the streets of Portland um, all summer long <laughs> and stuff uh, that we are talking again. You know what I'm saying? We're talking really sincerely and that we have all this new conversation to rely on right now and all this really uh, wonderful new work. Um, you know what I'm saying? We're, we're learning from each other. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, we have about 30 minutes left. Um, so I'm sure that our um, public is I'm waiting anxiously with their questions for you. This has been such a rich discussion. Why don't we go ahead and open up the Q&A function um, so that we can take some questions from the audience. So powers that be in the Zoom world, I can see the chat, but I cannot see a Q&A function from where I am. Well, I think they're just using the chat. We're just using chat. Okay. I think. <laughs> so somebody put something in the chat so I can see if I can see it because I don't see anything yet. Okay. Okay. Chat is now unlocked. Thank you for the test, Sabrina. <laughs> I got it at least. All right, so here's a question from um, Susan Bell Warner to everyone. What does the panel think of the McGirt court decision in Oklahoma, are you tribal sovereignty and rights? <laughs> I have a lot to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, McGirt is a fascinating case. It came out in July, it was Justice Ginsburg's last vote on the Supreme Court, um, re-recognized re um, the Muscogee Creek Reservation in Oklahoma. Um, probably the most important case in the last 100 years for tribal citizens. That case started out with some pretty violent native men. That's, that's how the case originated. One of the men, um, there were two defendants at issue. They were both one Creek, one Seminole, committed crimes on the Muscogee Creek Reservation. Um, Mr. Murphy, who was the first defendant, um, was actually on death row in Oklahoma. And so had very little to lose by trying some novel jurisdictional argument. And the seminal man McGirt, who is now the namesake of the, of the, of the case, uh, raped two four-year-olds. And he was sentenced to over a thousand years in Oklahoma State Prison. So these are incarcerated native men who've done heinous things, but have nothing to lose by trying any kind of legal argument that they can stick to the wall. You know, Mr. Murphy has an IQ of like 70. That didn't work, all right? So his, his attorneys are trying to get him off death row. And, and they came up with this argument that Creek Nation has never ceded our reservation. We've never accepted the state of Oklahoma's position on our reservation. But their argument was we were prosecuted in the wrong court because we committed our crimes on an Indian reservation. And that means pursuant to the Major Crimes Act that we should be tried in federal court instead. Now, is federal court gonna be kinder to them? I don't know. I mean, it, it remains to be seen, but they were trying to get off death row and trying to get out of a thousand year sentence. So it's very fascinating to me in this conversation about policing and about violent people and what we do with violent people and how we respond to their victims, that it was these criminal acts 
that opened up this opportunity to have the Supreme Court say, hey, treaties are treaties. And the Supreme Court doesn't say that very often, right? A treaty is a treaty and it says forever and that's what it means. So it's a complicated situation. And now Creek Nation is having to figure out how to police or patrol an entire reservation again. And the instinct is more police, more prosecutors, more victim advocates, right? And so I'm in a fascinating position right now as a Creek attorney advising my own nation on what we do now. But it's just so <clears throat> fascinating to me that it started out with this very carceral, heavy death penalty, thousand year draconian sentence story of these men that's now led to a case that may be as significant as Brown versus Board of Education or Roe versus Wade for Indian country. Um, I don't know what else to say, but that's how I, that's how I've been thinking about this moment um, in the McGirt decision. Okay, well, thanks for that, Sarah. It's <clears throat> complicated. Um, we have a question from Dylan Rodriguez to everyone. Does the panel have any thoughts about indigenous self-defense models and strategies in the current moment? Anybody thinking about self-defense models and strategies? <laughs> I'm gonna be sure I understand exactly the question, like self-defense in <laughs> what capacity? I guess, I, I know I, it means governance, but I guess I'm wondering, um, I haven't heard that phrase before. So I guess I'm, I'm wondering a little bit more about Is that. Is it like for like learning like physical ways to, wield off an offender that's trying to attack you? I, I took it more like a kind of Black Panther self-defense model, but I don't okay. know, Dylan, do you want to clarify your meaning in the chat? I don't see any, I, there's no. Yeah, I think that's what he means. And I would just take a, a, a stab at that. Um, I don't think AIM has actually ever disbanded. And I know in some places, you know what I'm saying, there is um, mostly to protect peoples. It's, it's, it has been, I've seen that activity more uh, around Standing Rock and those other places where people actually have um, come forth, you know what I'm saying, um, to, um, to work to, as protectors, okay? Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and that was an original function of AIM anyway. We're protecting, trying to protect vulnerable people on the streets. So I still see that activity. I don't think that it's ever gone away, but I think that in terms of well, what's happening right now, yes, I, ha I have seen that. I have seen a reorganization of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's so viable. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, um, it's a very real, I'm thinking about friends of mine in, um, I'm in a rural space up here, but it prides itself on being like more hippy dippy, I guess. I don't know. We'll see, we'll see if the tides turn quickly. Um, white people stop smiling and things get real. But, um, you know, I'm thinking about friends in rural spaces who fear now, who fear harassment on the street from settlers, individual settlers, from police, from, you know, it's um, white people are at their most dangerous, I think, at this particular moment. And so I'm a big just because I'm an abolitionist doesn't mean I think it's all kumbaya and we like sing together and hold hands. Like sometimes I'm like, no one's taking me cause I'm ready to fight. And um, I think Indian people in general are ready to fight and we have been fighting and that's why we're here. And so I'm all for, yeah, like a black Panther party model an AIM model um, is insofar as groups that provide a sense of yeah, self-defense and security from the onslaught of settler violence that is always, you know, uh, pernicious, right? Always there. But um, at this moment, it feels very life-threatening to many people. And I think, um, yeah, like walking in a, in a group and being prepared to fight um, is, is not like a wild thing to say. Like that's a common sense thing, I think, at this point. 
But we do need to make sure that we build systems of accountability within those kinds of reactions, right? Because AIM has not a great history sometimes with women. And it's so, true. you know, we have to make sure that whatever systems of street justice that we need to protect our lives and our bodies also have internal accountability mechanisms. So that if somebody does abuse their authority, their, their, um, their position of, of leadership, um, that there's a way to hold them accountable as well. I agree. I, what I learned from my grandson who worked with Black Lives Matter this summer is, is that they actually have that um, in mind. You know what I'm saying? That they had learned from the mistakes that we made many years ago. Uh, basically, well, I don't know if, about the women making mistakes, but nevertheless, um, the mistakes were made uh, in just in terms of the violence that was perpetrated on each other too. So I'm not gonna, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna sidestep that reality. But I'll tell you that I have seen some really um, basic, really beautiful and basic uh, consciousness raising inside these um, movements this summer, okay? And they've been combined. They're not just indigenous people alone. They're indigenous and black youth. So they were impressive to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, well, great. Here are a couple of maybe interrelated questions. Um, one is um, from Repair, um, Sandy, a question for Sandy. Can you say a little more about exploitation and abuses committed by police officers against people in systems of prostitution? And there's one from Lupita to everyone with the defund the police movement, how do our communities deal with human and sex trafficking? When I was working on the Shattered Hearts report, I was interviewing advocates on tribal lands and in urban areas and talking about victims' experiences. And I was surprised. Um, I should disclose I'm a survivor of um, of sex trafficking. So I had my own experiences with law enforcement um, threatening me with jail time if I didn't give them sex or if I didn't have sex with their buddy in the car. So there is that constant <clears throat> threat that's always there that makes you flinch away from law enforcement. But I was surprised even with my own experience how many of the advocates and how many of the victims I've talked to said, oh yeah, law enforcement are the worst. They are. They don't protect us. They set us up. They have their friends. They sell, them to that, sell us to their buddies. Um, there is, uh, when I worked on a mapping the market study with Lauren Martin in Minneapolis, um, we heard about men's sex buyer networks where guys would organize their friends to bring women in for the parties. And a lot of them were native women because in our, you know, I, I'm a sociologist, I can't help it, but there was um, a, a really interesting article that I saw that talked about perpetrator thinking and why certain people are targeted for sexual violence. And they said, there's two ingredients. One is target attractiveness. What does that perpetrator see in that potential victim that gives them what they want, whether it be excitement, that gives them status, that gives them sex, whatever it is. The other thing is capable guardianship. Capable guardianship means that that potential victim is surrounded by protective force. Family, a community, possibly law enforcement, but it's clear that there will be penalties if they target this particular person. That, the perpetrators weigh that. How attractive is the target? What am I gonna have to pay for it? The more, tar the more capable guardianship we have in our communities and that we have around our vulnerable women, we're gonna see less of that kind of exploitation because that's what protects. Did anyone else want to speak to those questions before we move on? Yeah, I think just to reiterate something I, I think I mentioned earlier, just, yeah, um, about abolish the police and then what are we to do again? I think it, it's also just fun to quote Shannon when she says really pithy things like <laughs> police are at best useless <laughs> and at worst are actively doing the harm. And so, um, 
Yeah, that's my favorite thing. And so I'll be thinking about that a lot. But but when I think about defund the police, a lot of people's knee jerk reaction was, um, you know, defund with an eye to abolish. A lot of people's knee jerk reaction was, oh no, we're all gonna be left in this like hellscape where it's like the purge and we're all vulnerable. And now, now none of us are safe. And all that really relies on that understanding that police keep you safe. And that's simply untrue because like Shannon has indicated at the best they do nothing, right? And at their worst, they actually menace you. So that what are we gonna do if we defund the police question to me really speaks to um, a wrongheaded uh, kind of faith that, that police are ever the ones keeping you safe. And also that police aren't actively facilitating trafficking rings up here in Humboldt. Um, I don't buy that for a minute. So I think actually, if we abolish the police, what we might find is that trafficking, um, some of the infrastructure of human trafficking is uh, disintegrated. We actually might find a position where we're able to help um, trafficked women and girls more readily. So I think it actually, instead of making more problems, it might create solutions if we remove the police. Um, certainly would create uh, less domestic violence in those homes and all the other things, right? Where, where there are police, there is more gender violence, not less. So I think uh, we need to be cognizant of that. Well, um, given what you just said, <clears throat> I can imagine what your response to this question will be, but I'm throwing it out to all of you. Um, do you all have thoughts on how Savannah's act, this is from Laura M. DeVos. Um, do you all have thoughts on how Savannah's act strengthens police by giving them more resources to respond to the missing and murdered indigenous women? Mm -hmm. Isis. Yes. <laughs> so Savannah's act was a law passed um, in September and signed by um, the current occupant of the White House in October. Um, it's difficult because Savannah was a real person. Um, the law was named for Savannah Greywind, who was murdered um, in uh, North Dakota. And um, so her name became a symbol of efforts to address murdered Native women. Um, unfortunately, though, if I'm being blunt and honest, um, I didn't oppose the bill, um, but I didn't really support it either. It doesn't really do much. Um, there's really actually no money allocated for anything except for the task force. And I'm allergic to federal task forces after serving on far too many. Um, I actually have a notarized statement to my husband that if I ever join another federal task force, he has pre-approved authority to pull me out. Um, <laughs> but uh, at any rate, it does. It's, it, it centers the federal government as the savior of murdered and missing Native women, that somehow by telling the US attorneys and the FBI that they need to come to more meetings, that we're gonna be able to, to solve the missing and murdered indigenous women crisis. So again, it's a hard thing to critique because it is named for this significant life that was extinguished and her family has allowed her name to be part of this movement. But if it was really gonna do anything, this, this current White House occupant would not have signed it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think of it. It's so loaded. I think of it like I think of hate crime legislation, right, in many ways. So we're all meant to be like, what a victory, right? Like there's now this legislation that means it's, you know, especially awful to do this kind of violence. Or now there's funds put aside for a task force or something that's going to evaluate um, what the state needs to do to, to correct a harm that the state causes and, and to me in a very like common sense kind of way um it it defies logic to ask the state to ameliorate the conditions that the state requires to exist in perpetuity so i get the affective pull like you know there should be more resources for for mmiw and as certainly a lot of organizers that work in mmiw up this way have have said such a thing like we need more resources we need more ability um, to provide service. Um, but to that question, I would say like, what kind, of, what kind of conditions of possibility are you creating when you turn to the state to fix a problem that the state requires, right? The state foundationally requires MMIW 
Um, so is it a victory? Um, it feels it feels like maybe not a great place to put a lot of our political energy. Okay, thank you. Um, from Carolina, we have, are you aware of groups that include indigenous and black relatives in talks about reparations? There is federal legislation that seeks to provide land to descendants of black people who were enslaved in the US as part of reparations but it seems that native people weren't consulted on whose land would be part of those reparations. Are these groups working together to create reparations that jointly or concurrently consider at land back, <clears throat> hashtag land back and harms? Mm. I think that's something that really does need um, to be, um, bring people together to discuss. I only know of some groups that are from, I know of um, Eve Tux, um, work in Canada, and that's the only one I know of where she had actively reached out to people on this question. Hmm. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? Yeah, just I'm not super familiar with groups doing work around um, reparation the way we traditionally think of it, um, but I guess my own kind of snarky response to those such task force is to be like, we can't wait for this to organize with the state for them to give us what they stole from us. So they yeah. can <laughs> <time to protect. laughs> like, I'm not negotiating with someone who stole from me. I'm into like, I wonder if we put like a pin in that around reparation and who has access to all the things they need to make life. And instead we work together to like dismantle the state. And then we can talk about like, what, what does everyone need to live, live a free life and what looks like justice? And how are we now community and family? So it's not this like arm wrestle we think it's gonna be over land and whose land is what, maybe more it's about rebuilding our nations with one another in this place. So I feel like put a pin in it, let's smash this state and then let's work <laughs> together in the future around, um, and I say it in a cute way, but I mean it very seriously. Like I'm, I don't want to beg from scraps from the table from the state that took from me. It's actually the state that doesn't have land, not us. Um, That's so well said. I, I'll shut up. But you know, <laughs> I really, I really do believe that 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 there's a that's the key there too, uh, because first of all, we we can't talk about it that way. We can't talk about it in the face of stolen land. We'll take one last question. We're almost out of time. Um, this one is um, posed from Chewy to Stephanie, but I think anyone could respond to this. Um, in regards to the discourse on abolition and the prison industrial complex, what are the possible solutions toward giving individuals who commit crime another chance to engage with society and successfully elicit rehabilitation? Yeah, um, that is the question. Right, so if we all collectively agree to not throw anyone away, if we've decided that we aren't throwaways and we are the people who have been thrown away so much, right? Like each of us as individuals and collectively. So then what does it look like if we're abolitionist when someone commits a harm and then what? Like, what are we to do, right? Um, and I guess for me, harm does a number of things, but what it, what does is confront you with um, how you have enabled that harm to happen in so many ways. Maybe not you as an individual, but when I think about like violent crime, for example, I think about people pushed to their most desperate moment and how they've been pushed to that desperation by a failure, a, a, a consistent failure by their community, by others largely, right? Um, and so instead of thinking about like this person did a violence to me, I, I, I think the onus is on us to really train ourselves in a new way to think about, you know, it's terrible this violence that this person did. And also how did we let them down? So it's not that they're guilty and I'm innocent. It's more that we all share blame when harm happens in our communities. And how do we rebuild? How do we go forward? Um, that's not always, I think, an easy, happy ending story. And I don't, I don't know all those stories. 
but I just know that I have people in my life who are dear to me, who have caused me a lot of harm. And what I did was um, be vulnerable. And, you know, it's, it's never neat or linear. It's a lot of back and forth and, um, you know, how feelings are non-linear in that way. Um, it's a lot of negotiation and renegotiation, but it's always with a commitment to not throwing someone away. So this sounds like kind of a woo-woo, I think, answer but that we do have capacities of care. We have capacity to call one another back in and to remind you that you have people you're accountable to and to be in that community, you need to address harm that you've done. And so it's about accountability, not because like punishment's coming, but uh, accountability because you belong to me and I belong to you and we need each other. We need our lives to live, right? We need each other's lives to live. Um, so that's my kind of in my feels feminist abolitionist response to that. <laughs> yeah, I think we need to take it away from the capitalist individual, you know, you, me, and back into the collective, you know, we need you. I think there is some research um, emerging that tells us that people who hurt others can be helped by understanding more about their own culture. And heritage and um you know it's again it could sound a little romanticized and you know like woo woo i guess is the, the technical term um but um but resilience is a new chapter in in i think social work and sociology when it comes to indigenous people because we're all tired of damage-based research so let's not let's not talk about what's wrong with our societies let's focus on what's right about our societies and cultivate that um, and, and so this, this area of resilience comes in. And one of the factors that initial research is showing that resilience is very um, common um, in communities where people have access to traditional principles, uh, foods, um, ways of living, ways of child rearing, that when those things are made available and they're accessible to people in the community, they, they tend to do better. Right. So I think if we're talking about ways to help people who have hurt others, to come back into our community, making sure they have access to elders, to people who can teach them the songs they never learned when they were children, that those things may in fact be better than punishment. Mm -hmm. And um, you know that's going to have to be a community by community because it's not gonna look the same everywhere. And that's another thing that fails with federal laws. Federal always treats every Indian tribe the same whether you're a village in Alaska or the Navajo nation, you know, and, and we're not. And, and I think that's, a, that's a, an important thing to think about is what, what's gonna work in my community may not work as well in your community. Absolutely, well, I think this is um, a good place to wrap up our discussion. I wanna thank um, our guests um, really from the bottom of my heart for this conversation. It's been absolutely terrific. So thank you, Diane, Stephanie, Sandy, Sarah, for being with us. Thanks to everyone who came and participated. I know there were many great questions in the chat that I didn't get to. Um, I encourage you all to look to the chat because there's some good recommendations going in there for articles and videos you can watch um, on the topics that we've been discussing. Um, many thanks again to Repair for organizing this event. And Repair would like um, to invite everyone to an event called Courage, the fourth event in their 2020-2021 community storytelling series. Um, transformation, co conversations and storytelling about healing and social action. Courage features six wonderful storytellers and will take place on Zoom on November 15th at 4 p.m. It's open to the public and free tickets are on demand. The registration link is in the chat. So be sure you check out the chat. Um, the recording of this event will be distributed to all registered attendees within the next 24 hours. Please, please feel free to share it with anyone who missed today's panel. And the UCLA American Indian Study Center is proud to be a co-sponsor. Please continue to follow us on social media at UCLA AISC on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or our face on our website at AISCUCLA.edu. Thank you again to all of our participants and to everyone for joining us. Thank Take you. Take care, everyone. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. And thank you. Love you guys. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Oh yeah. You did a fantastic job. Thank you. Yeah, so great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. That was a great evening, everyone. So Thank you. Bye. Great event. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Good to see, see you again soon. <laughs> Bye. Hey, see you soon.